Well, good morning, Hope Church. Good morning. It's so great to see you all here this morning. Came out in the snow. I don't know about you, but that I was not expecting that. So it's wonderful to see that we all braved it here to worship the Lord together. Well, welcome. If you are new here this morning, I want to extend a special welcome to you. Thank you for taking your Sunday to worship with us this morning. Um, we want to get to know you. We'd love to meet you and get you a free coffee, a nice warm drink. Uh, do me a favor, in the back of the seats in front of you, you will see a yellow card. Now that card is a visitor card. We'd like you to take that card, fill it out, and after the service, stop by the welcome desk, turn that card in. There'll be some leaders there to answer any of your questions, just to warmly greet you. And we have a little gift there to thank you for being with us this morning. And for the rest of you, our regulars and our members, we wanna hear from you too. So there's a green card in the back of the seats in front of you, that's for you. Be sure to fill that out. Keep filling out those connection cards. We're getting more and more of them each week. It's great, we love to see them. We love to pray over them. We just love to connect with you. So go ahead and grab that card, fill it out, fill out a prayer request, questions you may have, anything that you want answered, you can put that on there too. When you're done, at the end of the service, there are some gray boxes. There's about six of them at the exits. Just drop them in there, okay? Well, we've got a couple of things coming up that we want to make you aware of. Next Thursday, uh, Friday, November the 25th at 7 p.m., the young adults will be meeting. Young adult ministry will be happening. So if you're between the ages of 18 and 30, this ministry is for you. It's an awesome, awesome opportunity for you to meet other young adults, be able to fellowship, um, just play some games, hear a great word, be encouraged. They're also having a potluck. So if you want to attend this, be sure to sign up online. Let us know you're coming and also let us know what you'd like to bring to share. Also, it's almost that time for the Hope Kids Christmas party. It's our second one. It's gonna be so much fun. That's happening on Saturday, December the 10th at 2 p.m. Okay, this party is not only for our Hope Kids uh, family here, the family that comes to Hope Mississauga. This party is for all kids between the ages of four and 10. So have your kids, invite their friends, their family, their neighbors, all are welcome. The kids will have a great time um, doing some activities eating some great food, they'll hear a Christmas-themed story as well, go home with a very sweet present. So it's gonna be great. Be sure to register today if you want your kids to come. We do have limited capacity of how many kids we can take. So if you want your kids to attend, make sure, sign up online. Registration is on, open online today. Okay, if you have any questions or wanna know more, just stop by the welcome desk. We'd love to help you out there. Well, there is a lot happening. Christmas is coming, so there's a lot of events gonna be happening. Be sure to keep up to date and in the loop with all that's happening here at Hope Mississauga by subscribing to receive our weekly newsletter. All right, so why don't we stand together and get our hearts ready to worship the Lord together. My church, Psalm 100 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen, church. Let's worship the Lord together this morning.
we worship your holy name. We bow down before you, for you are worthy of all our worship. We exalt your name. We join in with the angels singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Father, we, we thank you for what you have done. We thank you for what you have done for us, for, for calling us your own, for bringing us back to you. Father, forgive us if we place things in our hearts other than you. Father, help us to turn our eyes back to you. Help us to gaze our eyes back to you. To you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Father, we exalt and praise your name. You alone is where our hope comes from. You alone is where our strength comes from. You alone are good. Yes, God, you are so good. We bless your name. We praise your name. Father, would you, would you continue to be exalted in our hearts, in this place, oh God. Father, speak to us, Lord. Have your way in us. Father, I pray this all in your mighty and precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. What a joy it is to worship the Lord together this morning. Why don't you go ahead, or you guys are already taking a seat. <laughs> so I, I would invite the ushers to come forward to collect the, these morning's tithes and offerings, and here are some options you can do. You can um, give offering online or in person, and I would like to invite Susan to come up this morning to read um, this morning's scripture passage. Good morning, everyone. Um, please read with me as we read today's scripture, Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 20, 31, starting at 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping Thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heaven, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is the word of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together, church family. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, the name that is worthy. The name that we just sang about is, is worthy of all blessing and honor, glory and power. The name that's life and living water. So God, we pray that uh, as we open your word, God, that we would hear your voice, that we would uh, exalt your Son and that we would be humbled in your presence as uh, creatures, as uh, sinners, and as 
uh, for those of us who have trusted in Jesus as saints who have been called into your family. And so, God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would be present here with us as we open your word, Lord. There is so much that we need to learn. We pray that you would teach us, God. Uh, There is so much about us that needs to change, and so we pray, Lord, that you would transform us and that we would hear your word and be ready to uh, respond. Lord, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our world is rapidly changing and gaining more and more momentum And we've been talking about uh, foundational truths in order to be faithful in confusing uh, times. And uh, our world right now is like this giant, swelling, unpredictable wave. And it's easy to get caught up in a wave. It's easy to get caught up in a riptide or in a current. And it's, it's easy to float along and to be caught up in it. But the truth is you can be easily drowned in a wave. And uh, even if you don't drown in the wave, eventually that wave is going to crash into something solid. And that's what we are uh, pursuing in the course of this series, is to find the rock-solid reality, the unchanging, timeless truth from the book of Genesis. Uh, we're, We're learning that the first book of the Bible gets the last word on how we are to live. And one of, the, one of the things that is happening in our culture, one of the waves that is, that is a growing and building momentum is just under the whole idea of what it means to be a human being. What does it mean to be a human being? And in, in, in some ways, uh, humans are being exalted to be godlike. We talk about when it comes to cloning or genetic modification in different areas of science. We, 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 see, we see the idea that human beings, we're just like God, that we can create life, that we can modify and alter the, the creation according to however we want with, with CRISPR gene editing. Uh, are we... Are we ready to play God that now's our moment, human beings, humankind? We, we've forgotten about God, and now we, we think we can play God. So in, in one sense, human beings think that they're no different from God, but then in another sense, at the same time, we see human beings talking as though they're no different from animals. Did you know that this summer there was an elephant before the courts, that this elephant that was in Bronx Zoo, it didn't get all the way to the American Supreme Court, but the New York Supreme Court, there was a case in which the the, the idea was that this element's human rights were being violated by being kept in captivity in the Bronx Zoo. That that this elephant had the same rights and, and 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 privileges as a human being. The scary thing was that it was a 5-2 decision. That that there were two judges at the the highest level that that said that this animal should be given the same. So either, which one is it? Are we the same as God? Or are we the same as Happy the Elephant in the Bronx Zoo? We are incredibly confused in our culture about what it means to be human. Many of us, at, at, we're, we're kind of schizophrenic. Some of us have too high of a view of what it means to be human. Some of us have too low of a view that we're just mammals, that we're just regular animals. Some of us say that we're like God, that we can create our own reality and carve out our own destiny and our own sense of purpose. We're like God. And then others of us say, no, we're like animals. There is no purpose. There is no destiny. The the truth is that whether you have too high of a view of God or too high of a view of humanity or too low of a view of humanity, whether you say that humans are like God or that humans are like animals, both end up crushing the human spirit. Because if you say that you're just like animals, then well, what's the point of any of this? Well, what's the point of falling in love or raising a family? What's the point of saying that you shouldn't murder another person or you should act this way or that way if we're all just... Animals, what's the point? It leads to utter despair. 
But to elevate human beings leads to utter despair as well. If we're the ones who are supposed to define our purpose and define meaning and define our identity like we're God, no human being can bear that responsibility. We don't have the capacity or the ability to define those things, and that's why we're so depressed. Because we're told that we can carve our own reality or shape our own identity, and yet we can't. Whether your view of humanity is too high or whether your view of humanity is too low, both end up crushing the human spirit. Where do human rights come from in the, in the first place? Even the rights that they were trying to give to that elephant in New York, where's this sense of rights? Why is it that human beings feel this, this sense in which there are certain things that we are entitled to as humans? Where do these things come from? The world in which we're living is kind of like that cartoon where the character is in a tree on a branch, sawing off the branch, separating themselves from the trunk, the very thing that is holding them up, and assuming that we're still going to stay in the air in the branch. That's not how it's going to work. And yet that is the world in which we are living in. So for the next several weeks, as we come to the end of Genesis chapter 1, we're going to slow things right down. Uh, Lord willing, over the next couple of years, we're going to make our way right through to Genesis chapter 50, but we're, we're we're going to pause right here and at the end of Genesis chapter 1 and rethink or remind ourselves about what it means to be a human being. Because we're on the branch and we're sawing away from the trunk. And that's why there's so much confusion about about gender, about sexuality, about racism, about the sanctity of life, about abortion, about medical assistance in dying. Why we have people who consider themselves to be transracial or or transgender or trans species. we've, We've lost sight of what it means to be human. And so we're going back to these foundational truths, the the image of God in every human being, the image of God that says that there is value and dignity and worth on every human being, whether born or unborn, whether male or female, regardless of skin color or ethnicity, physical or mental ability, and deserving of inherent honor, protection, and respect. That every human being is created in the image of God. So we're picking up the story this morning on day six of creation. And on day six, at, at, at the end of the day, God, the creation culminates. God has made, the, he's made light, and he's made the sky, and he's made the land, and he's separated it from the waters, and he's allowed vegetation to grow, and fish, and birds, and, and animals, all setting the stage for the pinnacle of his creation, human beings. Verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. God says, let us make man. If you're taking notes today, jot this down. It's vitally important for us to remember this as we seek to have an accurate picture of what does it mean to be human. We're not God and we're not like the other animals. So what are we and who are we? Here's the first thing I want you to write down, that we are creatures made by God. We are creatures who are made by God. Now, the language changes significantly in verse 26. The the wording is very, very different from what we've heard in the last last six days of creation. God says, let us make God, and then he says, in our image, according to our likeness. God shifts to the plural here. Why why is God, the one and only true God, why is he describing himself in the plural? Or who is he talking to when he says, let us make man in our image? 
Some biblical scholars read this and think, well, God is, is speaking to the royal assembly, kind of like the, the assembly of, of angels and spirits that you see gathered in places like Job chapter 1 or in 1 Kings 22 when Micaiah was prophesying to Ahab. This idea that there's this heavenly court and, and God is telling the whole heavenly court, let us make man in our image. I mean, that could be it, but the language here, if it's the whole heavenly court, does that mean that the angels and the other spirits also created humans? And that we're not just in the image of God, but we're also created in the image of these angelic beings? It just doesn't sit right. Let us make man in our image, the image of angels as well as God, or God exclusively so I don't think it's a royal assembly. Other people say, well, this is just a subtle nod to the Trinity. That with progressive revelation, we, we see, we know. I mean, already in chapter 1, verse 2, it said that the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. And then chapter 1, verse 3 says that, that God spoke. The, the Word of God spoke. And we know from John 1 that the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, that the Word is Jesus. And so... We can read John 1 back into Genesis chapter 1, and that's all fine and good. I mean, we, we kind of know the answers. We've gone to the back of the math textbook. We, we know the answer. We know that God is triune. But remember that faithful biblical interpretation requires, we got to understand what did it mean for the original audience? What, what did it mean for the people who were rescued from Egypt, who were wandering through the wilderness on the way to the promised land? They didn't have a concept of the Trinity Another option is that God is speaking in a sort of plurality of, of majesty. That, that, and this is a, a way that the kings and queens even today sometimes uh, speak. And it's, 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 uh, it's well attested in history that, that, that royalty speak about themselves even though they are singular. They speak about themselves in the plural. We, we don't really know how the original, again, we've, got, we've read to the end. We know John 1, so we know that God is triune. But for the original audience, we, we don't know exactly how they would have processed this. But we do know that there's a number of times where God seems to be describing, hey, let's do a group activity. And then, when God actually does it, he does it singularly. So look at verse 26 says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now jump down to verse 27. So God created man in his image, not their image, his image. In the image of God, he, singular, created them, male and female. He, so God describes a group activity, but then when it's actually carried out, it's an individual activity. Let me give you a couple of other examples. In chapter 3, when things go downhill, when Adam and Eve eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, plural, in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden. So God says, we've got a problem here as a group. He's become like one of us, plural. But then when God takes action, singular. Chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. Come, let us go down. And there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. Plural, let us do this. But then singular, so the Lord dispersed them. He acted individually. The, the book of Genesis just goes back and forth simultaneously God is describing himself in the plural and then acting in the singular. This happens in other places in the, in the uh, Old Testament. Think of this amazing passage in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. This is when Isaiah sees God on his throne and the cherubim and seraphim are there praising God. And God says, I, uh, or Isaiah records, I heard the voice of the Lord. So he heard one voice saying, whom shall I send? Then he says, who shall go for us? Who's the us? Is it, is it the seraphim? Is it the other winged creatures? that are? Who shall go for us? Isaiah said, here I am, send me. And then God alone said, go and say to this people. 
This just seems to be the way God talks about himself. That he often describes things in the plural and then in the singular without contradicting himself at all. And if you're uncomfortable with that, well, it's just how God has revealed himself. And I don't know how the Hebrew, original Hebrew audience would have understood it, but we see it time and time again in the book of Genesis and throughout the Old Testament. God says in verse 26, let us make. We are creatures. We have many things in common with the animal kingdom. Humankind and the animal kingdom share many things in common. Let me show you what I mean. As we study Genesis chapter 1, the animals, birds, and fish were created on day 5 and day 6. Human beings were also created on day 6, so they're created on the same day. Both of them were blessed by God. On day five, God blessed the animals and the fish. And then on day six, God blessed man and woman. God told the animals to be fruitful and multiply. God told the human beings, be fruitful and multiply. And science backs this up, that genetically and biologically and physically, we have a law in common with animals because we are similarly created by God. We are here physically because we were born from parents. Animals and fish and birds are, are similarly born. And we are dependent on things like oxygen or food or water in order to live. And just like because of the fall, just the same way that animals die and decay and become dust, we too as human beings die and decay and become dust. We are all creatures. And we have physical Bodies, just like animals, have physical bodies. And our physical bodies are part of God's good plan and intention and design. He created us with physical bodies, and at the end of day six, he said it is good. Now, we are living in a world where the self, our feelings and our emotions, our desires, the self has been separated from the body. And that rather than being a united, a holistic approach to human beings where we are physical and we are spiritual and mental and emotional, the spiritual, mental, and emotional has been separated and elevated above the physical. And so now we have people saying that my, my, bo my body or my biology might say this. This is, this is what I look like physically, but, this is, but how I feel on the inside trumps all of that. The self has been separated from the body and has been elevated above it. That's why we live in such a confusing age, because rather than letting biology and the world around us inform and help shape our identity... We say that our self now, our own thoughts or emotions, can dictate our identity. And feelings do not provide a good foundation for defining a person's identity. But God has created us as creatures. He has created us as physical beings. And that is part of his good plan and design. It's humbling it's humbling to age. It's humbling to get tired. It's humbling to feel hungry. All of these things show our creatureliness, our, the, the physicality of how God has designed us. It should humble us. And it, there's also a sense of accountability that God is the one who created us. He's the one who designed us. And so we need to look to him, not ourself, and we need to look to his design and to his word to determine how we live. Right when Josh was, was uh, uh, pray, or just finished praying and was telling the ushers to get ready to collect the offering, I had the pastor's worst nightmare. I came in and sat at the front row 
and then I put my Bible down on the armrest, and then when I went to sit down, I couldn't find my Bible. And I'm like, what? I don't know. What, where did it go? I, I, I was certain that I brought it with me. And then Wendy was kind enough to, to show that it had fallen back behind in her seat, and she handed it to me. And loved ones, that, that's just a metaphor that if I don't have the word of God to inform how we ought to live, then I have nothing. If I'm not bringing a Bible with me on Sunday morning to teach from at church, then I should just stay home. Amen. That it's the word of God that tells us how we ought to live. We are accountable to him because we are his creatures. So we are creatures made by God. That's the first thing I wanted to know. Here's the second thing. I'm going to divide it into two subpoints. The second one is this, is that we are image bearers made in the likeness of God. We are image bearers who are made in the likeness of God. God has done something special in creating Adam and Eve, in creating humankind. He says some things that he doesn't say to the other creatures. He creates Adam and Eve in a way that's separate and distinct from the way that the birds and the animals and the fish were created. Let's go back to that chart that we were looking at. So they have the created on the same day in common, blessed by God. They have that in common. Be fruitful and multiply. They have that in common. But God changes his language. Rather than let there be or let the earth bring forth, that's the language of the first days of creation when he's creating everything else. But, but he changes his language when he creates human beings. He says, let us, let us make God in our image. The, the, the animals and the fish and the birds, they were all created, it says, according to their kinds. That was their, re, their, their, their point of reference, was, was how the different kinds of animals were separate and distinct from one another. But with human beings, we weren't created according to our kind. There's, there's only one. It's just human beings. Special category. That much more special because we were created not according to our kinds. There's only one kind. And we were created... In God's image. God also highlights the fact in, in verse 27 that we're created male and female. He doesn't say that about any of the other creatures. And then he creates them and tells them to have dominion over all of the other creatures. Over all of the birds and all of the fish and all of the animals. So there is a special status, a special significance, a special dignity, a special identity, and a special worth that belongs only to human beings. But what does it mean to be created in the image of God? What does it mean to be created after his likeness? Look at, look at verse 26 again. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now, a lot of people at this point, when they're reading the Bible, they just start guessing. Well, I think the image of God means, means this, or it means, it means that, and that's not how we do Bible study. We, we, we need to let the, the Bible inform how we read the Bible. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 5, and find Genesis chapter 5, verse one, God didn't go very long before he helped us understand and explain to us what image and likeness actually means. Genesis chapter 5, this is the book of the generations of Adam. This is the first genealogy in the, uh, in the book of Genesis. There's, there's ten uh, different uh, genealogies. It says, when, when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Verse 2, male and female, he created them and blessed them and named them man when they were created. So it's sort of reviewing day six of creation. So we're, we're told about day six of creation in Genesis chapter 1. Then we get a sort of a zoom in on Genesis chapter 2. And God formed Adam out of the dust and breathed into his nostrils. And then Genesis 5, we have another summary of day 6. Now look at verse 3. It says, When Adam lived 130 years, he fathered a son. He's talking about Seth. He fathered a son in his own, see the word there? 
likeness after his, see the word there? Image. Likeness and image. God created human beings in his image and likeness. Adam fathered a son after his likeness and image. And so just in the same way that a father has relationship with his son or with his daughter because that, that father genetically is linked to that child, there is, there is an image, there is a likeness. And that is how God has created us. That in some way, and the Bible doesn't spell this out in detail, in some way, we are like God, just like my sons are like me, for better or for worse. They're according to my image, according to my likeness. And so we as human beings are created in the image and the likeness. And, and first and foremost, this is describing a relationship a loving family relationship. That is how God wanted to relate to us as human beings. And so jot this down as a, as a first subpoint that we as human beings have a special relationship with God. That we have a, to, to be made in God's image and in his likeness means that we, are, that we have a special relationship with him. Just like Seth, the son of Adam and Eve, had a special relationship with with his parents, he looked like them, he was born of them, we, are, we have a special relationship with God. Now again, we've got to be thinking about this through the lens of the original audience. They just escaped miraculously, powerfully, and gloriously from the most powerful empire on planet earth, the Egyptian empire, led by Pharaoh. And you can read ancient documents that describe Pharaoh, king of Egypt, as being the image of God and the likeness of God. And that's what gave Pharaoh the authority to rule was because he was the image of God. He was the likeness of God. He was like a son of God. And that's what gave Pharaoh the, the prerogative to enslave people. That's what gave him the, 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 the uh, purported authority to, to kill people whenever he wanted to, to throw Hebrew babies into the river, to drown them to death, that he was the one who could decide because he had the dominion and the authority because he was greater than every other human being because he was in the image of God. That was the culture that they were living in. But Genesis says, hold up. Those babies that were thrown into the Nile were not less important than the Pharaoh who made the call to execute them. And those slaves who were building the store cities were not less human or less significant or less important than the Pharaoh. Because every human being on planet earth, regardless of their skin color or their ethnicity or whether they're male or whether they're female, whether they're young or whether they're old, whether they're in the womb or out of the womb, whether they're mentally or physically able or disabled, each and every human being is made in the image of God and has a special and unique relationship to him. And so Pharaoh doesn't have the right to treat people like trash. He doesn't, he doesn't have the, the, the privilege of elevating him above his fellow creatures because they were all created in the image and the likeness of God. All human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. When we think about some of the greatest evils that have happened in the last century of humans mistreating other humans, there's one common denominator, is the ones who were doing the evil had dehumanized the ones that they were carrying out these evil acts on. 
Think about it. Chattel slaveholders argued that Africans were somehow subhuman and therefore justified the slave trade. Nazis called Jewish people vermin. The Bolsheviks called their political enemies former persons. The, the Hutus called the Tutsis uh, cockroaches. Uh, uh, abortionists call a living and healthy baby in the womb fetal tissue or a clump of cells. When you dehumanize an image bearer, you find a way to justify mistreatment or murder of that image bearer. We got to get, we got to make sure we get this right. Getting the image of God is vitally important because if we don't get it, it leads to unbelievable evil. That every human being is created in the image of God. And then closer to home, this is, this is where our sense of identity truly comes from. If you have a job and you love your job and you appreciate achievement, good for you, but you're an image bearer. That's, that's what truly defines you. If you're good looking and attractive or wish you were better looking or, or attractive, welcome to the club, that's fine and good. But remember, at the end of the day, you are an image bearer. When you look in the mirror, you're looking at an image bearer. That is your identity. Whether, whether you have lots of likes on social media or you're popular in your junior high classroom or whatever it is, that's fine and good. But at the end of the day, it's not, what, what defines you is not how many people like you. What defines you is that you are made in the likeness and the image of God, created for a relationship with him. Whether you're intelligent and have lots of education, again, good for you. But your primary identity is that you were created in the image of God. Your gender, your ethnicity, your skin color, your background, all of these other things that people try to elevate as being, this is the, this is the source of who I am. This is where my identity comes from. All of those things, again, not that those things don't matter. All of those things are secondary to the truth that you were created in the image of God. That is where identity comes from. So loved ones, this image of God thing, it affects the way that we look at history, it affects the way that we look at ourselves, and it affects the way that we look at one another. We're going to be diving into some difficult topics uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, topics that, there, I mean, there, there may be some Christians that you disagree with on some of these issues. There's definitely some non-Christians that you disagree with on these topics. But what, whether it's a Christian that you disagree with or a non-Christian that you disagree with, the person that you disagree with is an image bearer. And that when you lovingly exchange ideas, you need to understand that you're exchanging ideas with an image bearer and that they need to be treated as such. Changes the way that we think about others. Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39. This is, this is the great commandment. This is in our mission statement here at Hope. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it, likeness. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of course. At the end of the day, we shouldn't need the second commandment. Because if we love God, of course we're going to love his image bearers. Jesus' little half-brother, James, says, well, you know, with the tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. If you went over to your friend's house, you go down to their basement in their rec room, and you start playing darts, and before, they, before, they, before the game starts, they say, well, let me just take care of something, and your photograph is on the dartboard... And they're like, oh, I don't mean anything by it. It's just a photo. Like, we're really good friends, but just every once in a while, I like to throw darts at your photo. It's your image. And so you, you can't say that you love the person and want to destroy the image. That's not, that's, not how it, that's not how it works. It changes the way that we think about ourselves. It changes the way that we think 
about others, that we are all image bearers, and that means we have a special relationship with God. And then the, the second subpoint is, is this, that, that we have a special role within creation. We have a special role within creation. Verse 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion. Let them have, because they're made in my image, because they represent me, because they reflect me, because they resemble me as part of my family, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. It gets repeated again, dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. There's a special role that has been given to human beings. Now, some people skip right to the role and say the image of God is the fact that we are, we have this ability to lead and to order and we have things in common with God and, and it's the role, it's the functionality of what we do, but we, there's no role without the relationship. There's no ruling without the resembling. It's because we bear the image of God and his likeness, that is the reason why we have the authority to rule. Again, going back to the original hearers, Pharaoh believed that he was created in the image of God, the likeness of God. And all over Egypt, Pharaoh would have his image, little carvings or statues or paintings all around Egypt, his own images to say that Pharaoh is in charge here, spread all throughout the empire. Look at this image and know who's in charge. In the same way, we are the image bearers of God. And we are supposed to not just rule ourselves, but in the way that we rule, rule as an image bearer, we rule to show who the ultimate ruler truly is. So we're created in the image of God to reflect him and resemble him. Again, it doesn't get spelled out specifically but our relationship determines our role. You don't have subpoint B without subpoint A. It's the fact that we're created in His image that gives us that role and responsibility. Now, it's interesting how verse 27 and verse 28 relate to one another. Um, let's go to the next slide. In verse 27, it says, We're created in the image of God. And we're created male and female. Those two things are spelled out crystal clear in verse 27. And then in verse 28, it says to have dominion. That's related to the fact that we are in the image of God. And then verse 28, we're commanded to be fruitful and multiply. So he created us in the image of God and commanded us to have dominion. He created us male and female and then commanded us to be fruitful and multiply. So we're made in his image. Look at this next slide review from last week. This is the God who created the universe. This is the image that we've been created. And we've been created in the image of a God who speaks, a God who names, a God of order, a God who judges, a God of abundance, and a God who blesses. And so like God speaks, we are to speak. And like God names, we are to name. And the way God orders and the way God judges and the way God gives and the way God blesses, again, we don't do this exactly like God. We're not, we're not gods ourselves. We bear his image. Our words don't have the same power as God's word. Our judgments don't have the same weight and authority and consequence as God's judgments. Our abundance is finite and limited. God's is infinite. But we bear his image. And the way that we rule, again, it's not just up to us. Okay, dominion is ours. Let's do whatever we want. We are supposed to rule as image bearers. We're supposed to rule in this area and that area and this area to show that God is ruling over all. We're supposed to rule over creation the way, in a way that reflects how God rules over creation. We're supposed to care for creation. 
All around us are things that God has made. God has made trees, and he made a lot of them, and he made them with seeds that that get planted into the earth as a squirrel carries it around or a bird uh, eats the seed, and then you know what happens. And, And whatever, that trees are supposed to grow and to multiply. And so, loved ones, we're not supposed to hug trees, okay? You can if you want. We're not tree huggers as Christians, but we're tree lovers, and we don't, we don't want to chop them all down just to make as much money as quickly as we possibly can. We, 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 delight, we delight in the design of creation. We see that it is good. We love animals. And God has even given us animals in Genesis 9 to eat. Some of you are going to eat chicken and, and pig and, and, and cow later this afternoon. Glory to God. But we don't want to kill all of them. No, God created them to reproduce, to be fruitful and multiply according to their kind. And so we're supposed to care for them in a humane way. We're supposed, again, we don't hug pigs. I I guess you can if you want. But we're supposed to love them and protect them and provide for them. We as Christians, I mean, this is our thing. This is our father's world. And so having a world that is safe and sustainable, to have a planet that is teeming with life, I mean, this is our thing. Caring for the planet is, is our thing. And listen, there's, I mean, we can talk till the cows come home about, about how, what the best way to actually do that is in terms of, of forestry or in terms of, 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 of gas emissions versus battery-powered cars and mining and all of these different, we, we, we can talk about those things. But let's talk, let's engage because we care because this is our father's world. And we're his image bearers. And we've, we've been called, we've been given this authority to have dominion, not to abuse or exploit God's creation, but to create a, 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 a sustainable environment where his creation can thrive, where we can explore his creation and enjoy his creation. But as the story unfolds, just like in our world, Everything seems backwards, <laughs> where environmentalism has gone to such to the state where it's not humans kind of uh, having dominion over creation. It's this idea that humans are trying to somehow appease creation or appease the environment. But it all started to go wrong in the very next chapter in Genesis, well, sorry, two chapters over in Genesis chapter 3. You know when the serpent slithers into the garden? Who's supposed to have dominion in that context? Adam and Eve or the serpent? Not a trick question. Adam and Eve were supposed to have dominion. God was to rule over Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve were supposed to rule over the serpent. And what ended up happening? The whole thing went backwards. The serpent had dominion over Adam and Eve, and Adam Adam and Eve had the audacity to think that they could become like God. Look at at chapter 2, verse 5. This is the lie that Satan says. After he says, you will surely not die, that was a, that was a lie. Adam and Eve died. Verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Why is that a lie? You will be like God? Why is that a lie? Think about what we've been learning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Why is it a lie that Satan says you will be like God? Here's why it's a lie. Because they already were. They were created in his likeness. Again, Satan meant something different, but they had something better. They didn't need to become like God. They were made in his image and his likeness. And the whole thing got inverted. And the world started to spin out of control. And loved ones, that's where we are living right now. And it's still our father's world. And even though human beings are sinners, we still bear the image of God. And God sent his son, the ultimate image bearer. Remember, to to be an image bearer, to be made in the image 
or to reflect the image is to be a son or a daughter. It's a family relationship. And so Jesus, as the son, of course, ultimately, he's eternally been the son. He wasn't created in the image, but he has eternally been the image of God as the son. This is what it says about him when he came in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. He ultimately fulfills in the way that Adam and Eve and all of us have failed. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And he came to suffer and die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven and so that we could be justified from our sins and begin the painful but beautiful process of sanctification, which is becoming holy, which is becoming conformed into the image of God. Think about these familiar passages also in Colossians. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Romans 8, 28 and 29. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. We were being conformed into the image. Next slide. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. And we all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The sanctification process, God's Spirit is working in our lives to conform us into the image of His Son. And, and one day, ultimately, it's going to happen. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. We all bear the image of God through Adam, but we will one day bear the image of God through the second Adam, through the man of heaven. The man of dust failed, but the man of heaven was victorious, and we will bear his image. So what, what does this mean for us? Yeah, it, it is true that we, we need to understand what our sense of dignity and worth is and, what the, and, and the dignity of worth that belongs to every other human being on earth. But on a daily basis, just, just think about this simple story from the life of the ultimate image bearer, from the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He was, ac- he was asked about taxation and this, is, this was Jesus' response. He asked for a coin. And he held out the coin and he said, whose likeness is on this coin? And they said, Caesar's. And then he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. The image on that coin was Caesar's. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. The image on the person holding the coin It's the image of God. And so we give ourselves to be in relationship with him and to rule over creation with him. Every day we're simply giving ourselves to him, giving ourselves to him so that we would be more and more conformed into the perfect image of his son. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being your image bearers. Father, forgive us for the times where we let achievement or work or education or our appearance or our physical health or our skin color or our gender, whatever it may be, forgive us when we make those things primary rather than secondary. Forgive us for the times where we look at other people and judge them based off of some of those things rather than recognizing them as a human being created in the image of God. Lord, we thank you that you have us on this journey. We have been created in your image, and yet that image has been distorted because of the fall, and yet you are restoring, not just restoring, you are renewing us to be in the image of your perfect Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Help us, O Lord, to give to you what belongs to you, our very lives as image bearers. Help us to live for you and to love you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen. Let's, let's all stand together. Thank you so much to everyone that uh, brought in their shoe boxes this morning so they can be distributed to image bearers uh, all across the globe. If you left your shoe box at home, you can uh, bring it back. There's a couple events happening here this afternoon, so you can uh, come and uh, leave it there out in the, uh, in the foyer. And uh, so let's, let's remember that. 
Also, if you're newer to our church and want to take steps to get more uh, involved here at Hope, to become part of the family, the First Step class is happening today at 2 o'clock. It's a class that I, I teach for all sort of newcomers here at Hope, where we just go through everything that Hope believes, everything that we are about. And it's really just the first step. It's kind of the gateway into membership and serving and joining a small group Bible study uh, and all of those things. So we still have a few uh, open chairs uh, for people who want to sign up uh, last minute. And so you can check in at the welcome desk uh, about, about that. So the first step class is happening today at 2 o'clock. You are loved.